great. Okay, so thank you so much. And uh, today I will be uh, talking about um, multi, -proof, uh, multi proofs. So start off um, introducing the problem, right? So today, almost all rollups are still on what I call training wheels, right? There's still you know, some kind of mechanism that can basically override the proof and uh, we cre cause whatever outcome it wants inside of the rollup if it decides that the code has a bug in it, right? Like there is some kind of multi-sig, you know, like override governancey thing, whatever. And in pretty much every rollup that exists today with uh, very few examples, uh, so, you know, Fuel V1 is uh, one of them. And I think uh, some of uh, Starkware's uh, products might be another example, but with very few exceptions, like everything is on some kind of training wheel where even though there is some kind of proof system that is like theoretically there, the proof system isn't really in charge, right? Uh, so there's this uh, page on uh, l2beat.com uh, where if you go to the uh, risk analysis tab, it shows you kind of the status of uh, some of these, right? And uh, you know, for all of these, um, you know, you have uh, like some of the proof uh, techniques are either in development or they're overridable, um, right? So like, uh, you know, if, uh, if something is uh, upgradable without a delay, that actually means that it's overridable. So it basically every rollup that we have today is like not really actually controlled by code. It's like still ultimately controlled by, you know, some kind of uh, group of humans where, you know, you have N of them and M of them can ultimately push through whatever they want, right? So this is a status quo. And the yeah, question that I want to ask is like, how can we actually move beyond the status quo? Like, what would it really take to move us to a world where rollups are actually trustless or, or trust minimized and where the fraud proofs and the ZK snarks so that, you know, extremely smart people are, have been uh, spending thousands of hours working on actually means something. So why is every, almost every rollup using training wheels today? The answer is basically code risk, right? So this is just one random sample from the yeah, GitHub repo of the yeah, privacy and scaling explorations uh, team's uh, ZK EVM. Right? And uh, if you just like git clone it and then you go to the circuits uh, repo and then you do like find pipe zarg uh, dubc minus l and like you know fancy Linux stuff to figure out the total number of lines of code in the whole thing, you get this number, 34469, right? So 34,469 lines of uh, circuit code that is uh, needed that is in the uh, circuits of the uh, ZK VM. And this doesn't even get into the complexity of the circuit compiler itself. So there's a, basically there's like a lot of black box demons hiding inside you know, this entire ZK circuit to polynomial verification, blah, blah, blah pipeline, right? And it's, uh, for simple programs, it might be possible to make some kind of, some kind of proof that, it, that is bug free, right? So if all you want to do is just prove that something is a polynomial, then, well, okay, fine, you know, you can prove it. You can make KCGs and they're like simple enough and it's probably fine, right? So, you know, for EIP 4844, we can do. Um, maybe, you know, go a step further and, you know, start thinking about the, the shuffle proof in a single secret leader election. Okay, you know, maybe that looks like it's, uh, you know, the circuit's getting a bit more complex and it's like, you know, 10 equations instead of one. And it's like maybe on the edge. Get to proving an entire EVM and it's just crazy, right? So I think uh, 34,469 lines of code are just not going to be bug free for quite a long time, right? And so, the question is, well, if we can't make 34,469 lines of code bug free, then what are we going to do about it, right? Like, is there a practical near term and a medium term alternative that actually can still get us, you know, some degree of uh, trustlessness or trust minimization? So, one uh, simple option, and I think this is an option that a lot of people are gravitating to already is this idea of a yeah, high threshold governance override, right? So basically, you know, you have some number of guardians and you have some high threshold on it. So here you have a, a six of eight. You can make it be a 12 of 15. You can make it be 42 of 43. Um, you know, you can make it be 70% of token holders, like whatever, right? You have some kind of high threshold override where if it's very clear that some kind of bug has happened, then 
the guardians can override it and they can say, okay, fine, you know, here this thing that got accepted by the proving system is actually an invalid state root and the governance is gonna replace it with some different state root that it decides is valid. But that because the threshold is very high, you, it, it's very unlikely that it would be able to like actually pu push through something incorrect, right? Because like if you wanna push through something incorrect, you would have to actually, yeah, you know, corrupt like 75% of this uh, group of people, right? So this is one approach, right? You basically combine a proving system with a high threshold override, and then you get like some level of trust minimization, right? So, you know, in order for a uh, state root that is uh, correct according to the code to pass through, you only need two of uh, three of the uh, eight guardians to be honest. But then, in order for a uh, state root that's incorrect to pass through according to the uh, fraud proof to pass through, uh, you would need uh, six of eight uh, guardians to be dishonest, right? So, you have like some degree of trust minimization, and you get to the point where like. The code doesn't have absolute power, but at least the code means something, right? And so the question is like, well, how long is it going to take until the rollups that are you know, in this room, the rollups that are in this ecosystem, will get to the point where they're comfortable at least doing this, right? At least getting to the point where they're not like purely run by a, a, tra a training wheels, but where they're you know, run by some linear combination of uh, training wheels and actual code that's an attempt to prove the EVM. So this is option one, but option one, I think, has a, a couple of weaknesses, right? So one of those weaknesses is that it still does have some vulnerability to governance, right? So the, gov the vulnerability to governance is not that high, um, but you can totally imagine scenarios where what well, you actually do mess up and enough of the governors actually do get corrupted at the same time, and you know, the system does end up like actually yeah, you know, freezing or doing something, uh, something really bad, right? So that's one issue. Another issue is that I think in general, these kind of like community governance actors, there's a, there's a lot of uh, kind of complexities involved in choosing them. There's um, you know, the social question of like which ones different groups of people will trust, the legal question of uh, who is going to be willing to be a, a governor and um, you know, what even their risk and responsibilities are. Just like a whole bunch of issues that actually come up when you try to like actually create a set of guardians, right? So I think option one, like if you, you know, if you have to do it, then uh, I think it's uh, a good idea to do it. And I think it's definitely an improvement over the status quo, which is basically where you have a governance committee that generally can just override the uh, prover and make it and uh, make it uh, lead to whatever result it wants. But like, ideally, it would be nice if we could have something other than this, right? So, option two, multi-prover, right? So. The idea here basically is that instead of having a multi-sig of people, you have a uh, multi-sig of different proving systems. So the philosophy behind this should be pretty simple. It's uh, a, um, the uh, Ethereum network to some extent does uh, something similar, right? Because we have multiple implementations of the uh, Ethereum protocol. And so, you know, right now, I think both Prism and Lighthouse have like somewhere around a third of all the validators. And so if either Prism or Lighthouse have a bug, but the other clients don't, then, you know, the worst case is that the chain stops finalizing for a few hours and, and, and then it comes back to normal. And the average case might even be that the chain just actually keeps going and ignores them, right? So multi -implement, multiple implementations basically allow for a much more resilient network because a, if one implementation has a bug in one place, then chances are another implementation will not have a bug in the exact same place especially if that other implementation is created by a different team that has a different, that has a different philosophy and even just a fundamentally different architecture strategy. Um, so in this diagram here, the, the judge hammer and the scales of justice are meant to like, represent fraud proofs and arbitration, um, as some of you maybe might have already guessed. And the uh, like spooky looking uh, chip there um, that uh, Stable Diffusion generated for me two days ago is uh, supposed to represent a yeah, zero knowledge proving system. Uh, so 
doing a multi between a fraud proof and a ZK rollup is actually a really powerful idea because fraud proof based systems and ZK EVMs are just designed so fundamentally differently. They rely on like such fundamentally different assumptions that like, uh, like basically the, the level of correlation between them is going to be very low, right? Like, um, you know, basically the only way in which you might have some kind of uh, correlation is if, you know, either there's like some kind of bug or ambiguity in the yellow paper in a particular place or the same people are involved or there's like some really clever attack against both of them. But like the bar to get there is very high, right? Like you're not just going to get the exact same kind of bug in a fraud prover and the ZK EVM by accident. So, and then even within fraud provers, there's like a bunch of different approaches, right? So one approach, for example, is that you make a yeah, fresh new, like basically a new implementation of the EVM that's designed around proving one, spe one specific computational step. Another approach is you compile the GEF, uh, GEF like the GEF source code into some minimal virtual machine like MIPS, for example, and you then make a, a fraud prover for MIPS and you just like push the entire GEF code through, the, uh, through that and like you, you just create a fraud prover of, of, uh, of MIPS and have everything go that way, right? And, uh, but instead of GEF, maybe you could stick Aragon in there or maybe you could stick Nethermind or maybe instead of MIPS, you could use some different machine, right? So there's a lot of different ways to make a fraud prover. There's also different ways to make a ZK EVM, right? So the PSE ZK EVM is kind of a direct compilation. The yeah, Polygon Hermes team, I believe, is doing this uh, clever thing where they yeah, first compile the EVM to an intermediate language and then proving that intermediate language only takes like, I think about 7,000 lines of code instead of 37,000. Or, or maybe, sorry, it's like the representation of the EVM in their assembly is what takes 7,000 lines of code, right? So there's different approaches and then there's the, you know, well, there's the ZK sync strategy of like just going straight solidity. Um, so there are different ways to architect these systems. And if you have three different proving systems that are architected very differently, then you might have a lot of redundancy. So this is another approach. Um, option 2B, um, more complex variants of the uh, multi-prover strategy, right? So one idea is uh, kind of self-canceling, right? So if someone submits two conflicting state routes to one particular prover and both state routes pass, then that prover gets turned off, right? Um, and so the idea here is basically that, you know, if some prover is able to accept multiple state routes, then well, clear or clearly something is wrong, right? Because it's saying yes to two conflicting outputs. And so you shut it off and either you reduce the size of the multisig or you replace it with governance that has to choose a different prover. Um, that, so that's one approach. Um, another approach is uh, if no successful message gets passed through a particular prover for seven days, that prover is turned off, right? So if the prover is deadlocked, if the prover is being unable to accept even things that are valid, then you can shut it off too. So one of the yeah, interesting things about these two ideas is that they're actually kind of inspired by smart contract wallet designs, right? So the concept of uh, self-canceling, that's uh, kind of a, a very close parallel to the uh, con uh, to this uh, concept of vaults that um, I think uh, Emin Grincier and a couple of other people uh, were like really promoting a few years ago, right? Where basically you have a smart contract wallet where you can initiate a withdrawal, but then that withdrawal takes 24 hours to finish, and before those 24 hours come, uh, you can. Uh, that exact same key can cancel the yeah, withdrawal, right? So the idea basically is that if you get hacked but you still have your key, then you can like constantly prevent the yeah, hacker from actually taking the money. And then there would be some third override key where like if one key clearly keeps canceling itself, then that third key with like maybe a one week delay can actually take funds out, right? So Basically, this approach is like that exact same idea, except for a person, ex, be, instead of being applied to a personal wallet using private keys, it's applied to a rollup using multiple provers. And then the second idea, it's like basically, um, you know, it's like social recovery for provers, right? It's like, uh, you know, if a prover is clearly not able to do something, then like some other mechanism can switch it, right? So you can actually do some like surprisingly um, interesting and uh, clever stuff here. Um, so this gets us to a yeah, third uh, technique, right? So this is a 
two prover plus governance tiebreak. So let, we're going to make two provers, and we're going to make them very different. Uh, so one of them is going to be ZK, and uh, one of them is uh, going to be uh, optimistic. And uh, we have a two of three mechanism, right? Basically, yeah, so we have a two of three between the ZK, the optimistic, and governance. Um, so there's actually a bunch of different ways to architect this, right? So one of them is the thing that I yeah, mentioned on Twitter about a month or two ago. Basically, the idea uh, being that when you submit a block, there is a 24-hour time window. And after that 24-hour time window, if the yeah, block gets uh, accepted if there is a snark. And um, within that, tw uh, that 24 hour time window, if uh, someone opens up a fraud, pr a fraud proof, then the yeah, fraud proving game and the snarking game, they both run. And then you know, if they agree, then, that then whatever they say is, uh, is accepted as the result. And then only if they disagree, the governance has to like, come in and uh, provide the correct answer, right? So if you want to take an approach that like, minimizes the governance's role and makes the governance be a more like, emergency thing, then you'd probably want to do that, right? You'd, you'd want to create a system where, like, by default, you want to have a kind of two of two between the optimistic and the fraud. And, or sorry, between the uh, ZK and the fraud. And the way you do this is by having a time window. And because you have like a two of three, you know, you can be more aggressive. Instead of seven days, you can make it 24 hours. And um, you, know, you can say for a block to be accepted, it has to both have a snark and have a 24 hour window pass to make sure fraud proofs didn't come in, right? And then if they disagree, then you do uh, some governance uh, thing. But there is, um, if you are okay with governance being kind of more, act more regularly active, then there is another approach, which is you, for every state route that gets submitted, you just let all three of these games run. And then as soon as two of these games accept the block, then that block gets accepted, right? And so in the happy case, blocks would actually uh, succeed basically immediately, right? Because uh, when you have a block, then a ZK proof uh, passes for that block and the governance uh, accepts a block and um, you, know, you have a proof and then the block is finalized within like less than an hour. Basically, your only limit is going to be how quickly you can make Z you, you can make zk snarks, right? You know, right now it's uh, it looks like zk proving EVM blocks is, is like somewhere in the hours, but you know, in the future, I have uh, a lot of faith in you guys. The technology will improve, and um, you know, we're gonna get zk snarks um, in uh, 12 seconds, right? Right. Okay. So, like, there's different options, right? Is basically what I'm saying. There's like this. Uh, large design space of uh, different options that you can choose, different trade-offs that you can take, um, different, uh, depending on like how much you value speed versus how much you value minimizing the role of the governance, you know, versus a bunch of other considerations. There is like a lot of options that you can make and it's uh, probably worth like thinking really th deeply through these different options and uh, figuring out which, uh, which one of these um, actually makes sense, right? So, Advantages of this approach, right, is that like it actually combines all of the uh, ad advantages together, right? So like for this approach, you don't have to trust the governance because uh, even if the governance is completely evil, even if seven of seven get corrupted, it can't contradict the the provers if the provers agree, and you're protected from a bug in either one of the two provers, and you know ideally, you know if the, if the provers have a very different construction, then the chance of the two having simultaneous bugs is going to be uh, very tiny, right? So that's the yeah, advantage of this kind of design. Um, one other interesting thing that's worth talking about here is like, what does the code look like for the multi-aggregator, right? Because uh, like the the goal the goal of this is to try to minimize the number of lines of code that you have to like certify, yes, this is definitely bug free. And if it's not bug free, people are going to lose 11 and a half billion dollars, right? So you want, like, you don't want that to be 34,469 lines of code, but like maybe it has to be 100 lines of code, maybe it has to be 200. You want to like minimize that as much as possible, formally prove that as much as possible, coordinate on using the same uh, code as much as possible, right? So the other question is like, how we minimize like the multi-aggregators themselves, right? There's a, there's a lot of different possibilities. One interesting one is that you just literally use a Gnosis safe wallet, right? Like you just literally throw coins into a Gnosis safe wallet where you have three different keys that are owners. It's just a plain old two of three Gnosis safe. 
and the three wallets just are, one of them is itself a Gnosis safe of four of, of, uh, four of seven guardians. Another is an account that pushes through a, uh, a message if a snark tells it to push through a message. And a third one pushes through a message if it tells a frog prover to push through a message, right? So if you do that, then like you can even reuse existing code for the thing that actually does the aggregating, which I think is really cool. And like I think really does reduce the surface area of like code that you have to trust unconditionally by quite a bit, right? But you know, these are all also things that are worth uh, thinking about, right? So conclusions here. Um, so I think the big one is that ZK EVMs are not going to be bug free for a long time, right? And I, this is something that's probably worth internalizing and accepting, right? Basically, like, we're, what's amazing the, about the ZK space is that I think it ha, it's the one part of the crypto space that actually has exceeded expectations in how, how fast things are going to come, right? You know, you got like the merge and it's like, oh, it's going to come in 2015, oh, 2017, and like, oops, it came in 2022. But then we got ZK EVMs and it's like, oh, they're going to come in 2030, maybe 2027, and then like, oops, we have prototypes in 2022, right? So... That's like the good news about ZK EVMs. But the bad news about ZK EVMs is that I think we're going to have this long period of time during which they exist, but they're like fairly untested. We don't know if there's bugs in them. You know, we'd, if uh, we don't, there might be bugs in, the, in some scary proof systems. There might be bugs in, compi in circuit compilers. There might be bugs in the uh, ZK EVM code itself. And so for some number of uh, period of time, which, might, which I think will easily last uh, you know, quite a few years, we are going to have these kind of circuits that we trust to a high degree, but we don't trust completely, right? And the fact that we trust them to a high degree means that we should use them, right? And it, me and it means that we should actually like, get the benefit from them and not just create systems where we're giving lots of power to a multisig. But the fact that they're not perfect means that we also have to uh, compensate for the possibility that something about them actually breaks. So with multiple implementations, with governance backups, with multiple implementations and governance backups, we can minimize the chance that bugs are going to actually lead to catastrophic outcomes. There is a trade-off space between security versus bugs um, and security versus bad governance, right? And I think like... To this year, everyone's optimizing for security against bugs, which is probably correct. Ten years from now, I think everyone should be optimizing for a security against bad governance, which is probably going to be correct then. And like between now and ten years from now, we should kind of slowly move that slider from the uh, you know from a kind of trusting governance more to trusting the code more as the code becomes more trustworthy. Um, so. I think uh, you know keeping governance involved is uh, a, a good idea, but you know it's also a good idea to uh, keep it um, only involved in uh, emergencies. Now, this is um, intended to be about a kind of a, a talk about layer twos, but I think one other interesting thing that's worth mentioning here is that there is also a layer one angle to this concept of like zk multi proving, right? And the uh, issue here is like we want to use zk VMs on layer one, right? Like z my vision for the future of running an Ethereum node is basically that you know you should not need to have a piece of fancy hardware. You know you got your phone. You should be able to have a full Ethereum node staking a million dollars of ETH if you want to running on a phone. And uh, you know you you did. How do you validate an Ethereum block? You get an Ethereum block. That Ethereum block might contain you know three and a half megabytes of data. Okay, fine. And and a snark, right? Download the three and a half megabytes of data. Hash it, stick the hash into a public parameter, verify the snark, done. Block is correct. Like that, so, you know, we, I, it would be lovely if we could get to the point where verifying Ethereum blocks and running an Ethereum full node is as kind of simple and low resource and decentralization friendly as that, right? But in order to get to that future, we need to have a snark that can verify everything, right? We need to have a ZK EVM and a ZK Ethereum consensus layer and probably recursive ZK ZK and like ZK everything. And um, you know, we're, we're basically gonna have to trust everything to a bunch of polynomial math some weirders in universities invented. Um, so, okay, not everyone's in university. Dropouts contributed a lot to the ZK space. Um, you know, three cheers for dropouts who contributed to, these, to, to polynomials, yay. Um, but 
you know, if we want to actually get there on layer one, then we're also going to go through this period of time where like, we can't trust one implementation to be infallible. And so then the question is, well, what would a multiple implementations vision for ZK snarks at layer one actually look like? And I think here there's like some interesting answers, right? So one possibility for this is uh, that like, okay, you know, we have different clients, you know, we have like Prism and Geth and Lighthouse, um, like we have like five execution clients, we have five consensus clients, and maybe we're gonna also have five uh, ZK EVM engines, right? And so instead of there being 25 uh, client combinations, we're gonna go up to 125 client combinations, which makes Ethereum five times more diverse and secure. Um, so then you know, the, the question is like, okay, you know, somebody creates a block and then the peer-to-peer -peer network is just gonna generate a proof for a block of each type, right? And like, okay, you know, maybe you have a, a node running, you know, ZK EVM engine A that, that created a block, but then because the data is all in the clear, once it gets out there, someone else can come along and they can make a ZK snark that is compatible with ZK EVM engine B. And then people running um, engine B on their clients are going to be able to verify it. And so you are going to be able to like basically get the same benefits of client diversity, but you know, in this ZK EVM world, right? But then the, so, then the, uh, qu the question is like, well, you know, how do we actually get, how do we actually get there? Like, what, do, what is the uh, first part of the uh, Ethereum consensus that we actually are willing to ZK? Is it actually going to be possible to ZK proof things quickly enough, right? You know, there's like a lot of these different issues, but I think realistically, like, some kind of multi-proving future like that, and possibly even a hybrid future, right? Possibly even, like we might even see a future where, for example, all the institutional stakers still run phone, still run regular phone nodes, but some home stakers um, run a couple of experimental ZK provers, right? Like we might end up going through a couple of those phases, but I do expect that like some kind of multi-proving and hybrid proving system is going to be the future on layer one as well, and uh, not just um, layer two. So, thank you. I'm trying to help out. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, no, did I uh, miss the slide? No, there's like a, there's a happy giraffe there. Okay. Yeah, there's a happy giraffe.